time welcome welcome again we're always uh, grateful for weed and the, their great hosting food and <coughs> facilities we are recording this <coughs> yeah. yeah yeah just you know be wise i had to edit my own a few times um and if you let's see restrooms are i never even brought that across actually out the door and yeah that way for those of us who've been here before, we um, have our presenter here for a while. This presentation, 7.30ish, you guys want to go, whatever, um, Q&A, or we just have a lot of discussion afterwards as well. Anyways, it's good to have Charles here. He's coming out from Buoyant. Um, been with them since, you said, June? Or was that uh, May. Yeah. Or was it May, May, June, yeah. And right. so I just flew up from San Fran to be with us today, and he's he's the man when it comes to this stuff. So, uh, as I indicated to him earlier, this group is made up of a lot of variety and those technical people. Uh, a lot of people probably have even implemented some of the stuff that you've been talking about. But those that haven't done it and are new here, that's fine too. Uh, no, no question it is a dumb question. So, doesn't matter what level we're at, just just ask away. So. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Charles. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you uh, all for being here, actually. Let me still get a little set up here. But to echo Paul's comments or sentiments, my, my goal here is just to chat with you about service mesh stuff, things that you can do with service mesh. It's meant to be a dialogue as well. So if at any time you all have questions, we can take a pause and I can answer your questions and we can um, you know, go through it. I, I find that to be a pretty, uh, a much better way to talk together than talking at you. Almost have this set up. I know the thing I'll need to do. I'm just going to mirror these because it'll be easier for me as I go through and type stuff. Make sure I have all the appropriate things open. I'm going to go through it and mirror. Okay. I think we got this.
Oh, you know what? That was user error. I was pressing the wrong direction. <laughs> okay. So again, thank you so much for having me out. It's uh, a lot of fun to be able to go and talk to folks who have worked with open source, especially in this time world where we're in this, what I see as an inflection point um, with Kubernetes and distributed systems and Kubernetes and Kubernetes and Kubernetes. So um, I, who here is not working with Kubernetes? Okay, we'll get, we'll get you there. <laughs> um, okay, good. And who here is familiar with service mesh and service mesh concepts? Great. Anybody using a service mesh? Good. What's the name of the service mesh that you're using? Istio. Cool. Uh, they're doing some awesome work uh, to get the, the control plane down into a smaller size. Complexity. Yeah, yeah, the Istio D project. Yeah. Um, we we communicate with them quite a bit. Um, it's kind of a, a frenemies situation. And a lot of the conversations that we have are just around, um, you know, people talk about the service mesh wars and Kubernetes won. Um, I've been having conversations with folks at Aspen Mesh uh, and internally at Buoyant, we're thinking in link, the Linkerd community, we're thinking service mesh doesn't have to be winner take all. So, that wasn't actually part of my notes here. This is just kind of the messaging that we're thinking around and thinking about. And so um, if that resonates with you, great. I'm here to answer more questions. Tonight, I'm here to talk about uh, using service mesh concepts for in a practical way, right? So we hear about service mesh. Uh, who's asked themselves, do I need one? <coughs> And you hear this a lot. And there's articles that say, uh, or blog posts that say you don't need one. Some that say you do need one. And who did anybody go to San Diego KubeCon? And then there was the zero day event called Service Mesh Con, sponsored by Voyant. So it was really, I didn't see our CEO's slide deck beforehand, but it was really funny when I saw uh, some one of my colleagues posted a picture of. Picture slide that just said, uh, "Do you need a service mesh?" No. So the inventor of the service mesh is telling you that you probably you you may not need one. It's really does your application require it? Or oops, I should fix that. Um, so what I want to go through with you today is high-level service mesh concepts, and then um, actually I'm going to advance forward a little bit here. This is me. These are all my socials. Oops. Anyway, um, I was diving into what we're. Stop. Uh, okay, go back. Okay. Uh, service mesh overview. We'll talk about. Uh, I'll do a quick demo of deploying Linkerd. The goal here is to show you how simple and easy it is based off the design philosophy of the Linkerd development team. And then we'll dive into SMI and Flagger. So this actually, Paul gave me a heads up that some of you are, are very experienced and so I'm with Kubernetes. And so I'm very excited to dive into what I consider to be an advanced topic. So we're gonna skip intermediate, we're gonna go beginner and then jump straight into um, some pretty advanced stuff with SMI and Flagger. Is it, has anybody here used uh, flagger. We tried it. Okay. What'd you think? We just did it as like a proof of concept. Okay. Yeah. It's good. Okay. And then I keep saying SMI. It's uh, that is short for service mesh interface. I'll do. I'll dive into that and uh, <coughs> what that means for the community. Um, and then I will show you an actual running instance of uh, a canary deployment. And then we can go into questions and, and discussion. So, uh, service mesh overview. When we ask ourselves what a service mesh is, we have to consider why we actually need a service mesh. The founders of Buoyant, who are the original developers of Linkerd, previously worked at Twitter during the 2010 uh, re-platforming re that they did. And so when they moved the Twitter framework from a monolithic Rails application over to distributed systems, 
they began to realize that, okay, you're gonna need something to keep track of everything that's happening here. And so what, are you, what is everything that's happening here? You've got inter-service communication, you need to know failures and success rates, you need to know what's happening uh, under high traffic, how to apply retries, how to apply timeouts. And so all of these concepts went into uh, the service mesh. <coughs> This last diagram is typically what we see in any Kubernetes presentation or even distributed systems presentation, right? You've got traffic that comes from the internet and service A talks to service B and service B talks to service C and you have all this <coughs> service communication. And the reality, this, this is not reality. This is just, it helps us to wrap our minds around what distributed systems look like. The reality is we have something like this. We have multiple instances of multiple services some services may be talking to external data stores, other services may be talking to external APIs, and then services continue to talk to each other. And so it's a much more complex system. And one wonders why we add all this complexity to, uh, to systems that were probably pretty fine before. And the reason for that is just is largely because of virtualization and optimizing costs by maximizing resource usage such as CPU and memory uh, through virtual machines. So when you get the system up and running, you're printing money, right? You have your, everything's firing on all cylinders, your application, your users are happy, you've got nine nines of uptime, everything is great, life is good. And again, <coughs> not the reality. Sometimes, uh, you know, you get a bunch of a spike in traffic, or your database might just start to catch on fire. Or that external API that you're using for authentication or location-based services all of a sudden becomes unavailable. And that's, out, again, out of your control. Or, not that this has ever happened to anybody here, but let's say a developer releases a new version of a service and there might be some uh, suboptimal performance there, and so it slows down one particular service. So these are all things that we need to be able to keep track of and monitor. Um, and again, talking about a hypothetical to real world scenario is what happens when all these things go bad at once, right? Or two of them go bad at any given time. The infrastructure for the service mesh is designed to help to identify these issues, reduce mean time to detection and mean time to resolution. So we talk about the basics of the service mesh. We've got two components. There's the data plane and the control plane. So I'll go through these pretty quickly because I think everybody's got a good concept of this here. The data plane is where all the traffic is. If requests are coming in, they're going through the service. In this case, we represent the data plane as a group of sidecar proxies injected into our Kubernetes pods. The control plane is used to configure those sidecar proxies when those services, when those pods uh, are scaled up or when the deployments are scaled up and we get more and more. And this tells it, like uh, in our case, uh, in fact, we'll take a look at, um, so the control plane, will, it, it, when configuring mutual TLS, it will issue that certificate to each of the services so that when the services are communicating with each other, they're talking using the same uh, TLS certificate. Uh, another thing is where to, another configuration might be where to commit metrics to, and that's gonna be key for what I'm talking about tonight is those metrics and how we collect them. <coughs> we collect them uh, in the Prometheus, or actually I should say we emit Prometheus metrics, and those are then collected into a Prometheus store. So for uh, Linkerd, and again, these are high level service mesh concepts, but during the design of Linkerd, the team decided what well, first was observability, and that provided to us with the golden metrics um, that we can collect and take action on. We've got security. I recently just mentioned mutual TLS. And so um, many, who, who here works for a company that is regulated and has to have secure traffic behind the firewall? Yeah, so we see this use case a lot. Um, in mm -hmm. fact, I think probably the two primary use cases that we get for service mesh are observability and security. Then we have reliability. This means implementing things like tryouts or 
timeouts and retries. Tryouts are what I did in high school for football, and I didn't do very well. So um, <coughs> you know, timeouts and retries. So again, when your services, when that service, the new version of the service is deployed, and you are, uh, it's a little slower than it previously previously used to be. You now have the metrics to compare and collect, and you also have the mechanism that you can do to uh, implement retries in a way that doesn't end up DDoSing your service or uh, overloading the service and making the situation worse. And finally, we have uh, traffic management. And again, that'll be part of what we talk about with uh, the concept of canary deployments and splitting traffic from one version of the service to another version of the service. Any questions on those basic High level concepts. Okay, so again, these are, this is detail on what I just talked about. Uh, I think we can move through these really quickly because I feel like everybody understands these, these concepts. So the traffic management piece, we're going to see uh, an alteration or a modification of this diagram when we start talking about the canary. Design. So this is, again, the basics. You've got uh, for splitting traffic, and you can do this for blue green deployments. This can be done for um, canary deployments, and yeah, those are the, the two main use cases. Okay, so I promised you a quick demo. You can see the demo is my typing skills, which may or may not be good. So let me make sure I'm looking at the right cluster. I'm running kind locally. Is anybody using kind? I, I love it. Great. So I'm going to show you um, <coughs> I have a bunch of aliases, like I assume you all do as well. If there's a command that I ever type that looks fishy, uh, pause and ask me about it, and we'll, we'll get that. Uh, so um, this shows us all the pods in the system. So all we have is cube system running on kind. So I've already downloaded Linkerd. One of the steps is to download the CLI. Um, I just saw a tweet today about somebody who said, why do we need to download CLIs to install things in your Kubernetes? Mm -hmm. I'm not opposed to it, but it's, that's, that people who make that decision are above my pay grade. So Linkerd has a CLI. Um, I can do Linkerd version. Actually, I just do Linkerd and it shows me all of the commands that are available. Is this readable? Yeah. Okay. So we'll do <coughs> version. I've got the latest version of the client, who's the stable 2.6.1 version, and I haven't installed it on my cluster yet. So the first thing I need to do is check to make sure that it can be installed on the cluster. So we have this set of pre-checks that goes and uh, that by very quickly, but we check to make sure the Kubernetes API is available, that it's a valid version for running with Linkerd. Uh, Pre Kubernetes setup to make sure we can create cluster role bindings, all the RBAC pieces, role bindings, uh, config maps, the resources that Linkerd needs to run. We have to make sure that we have access to the right capability, <coughs> specifically to rewrite uh, IP tables. And um, well, I'm not connected to the internet. So it seems like you answered your own question too. This is why you have a CLI to install things, because it gives you a rich interface to solve. <laughs> Yeah, manifest can't really do that for you on its own. Right, and so, and then you get to the point of you're reading, trying to parse Kubernetes errors to figure out what went wrong. Right. And so, um, I just approved a couple of PRs for additional check functionality today. So um, that's a lot of fun. As a side note, I get to work on open sources. My day job. So now we can see I connected. Uh, I've got the latest version, the latest stable version. So. I can install Linkerd. Um, so I will do that. Just an install command, and we type that to q control apply dash n. And that's going through and creating service accounts, cluster role bindings, mutating webhook controllers, uh, validating webhook controller, all the things, all the pieces in the control plane. So if I look at the control plane, I see a bunch of pods that are starting and initializing. Um, the identity piece, which issues those TLS certificates, the trust anchor, that is the trust anchor. We've got a small in-memory Prometheus instance that lets us collect metrics, um, and a couple of other pieces here that I will dive into. But um, 
Typically, we just do Linkerd check again without the pre-flag, and that tells us um, that things are happening. So I'm going to open up another tab. Actually, okay. So Linkerd is up and running, uh, and that is great. How do I know that? I can do Linkerd dashboard. And that is going to bring up <coughs> stuff is window space. Okay, so this shows us the Linkerd dashboard. And what we've got here is um, a UI that shows us the, the, the single pane of glass, as everybody likes to have. This shows us that uh, all of our namespaces had I deployed another application in here, which I, I could do actually. Let's do that. Um, this is one of our example applications. And you can see that Linkerd has already detected that this namespace exists. Um, one thing that I will do is um, we'll annotate the default namespace. So Q control annotate namespace default And what this does is um, initiates auto injection for any deployment that is it, that is created in, in that namespace. So right now we see we have four pods. Uh, all with one container each. If I restart the deployment and then you see that the not ejecting. That's what I get for trying to do live demo. Uh, <coughs> reload our namespace. Yep. Start. There we go. So now we see that the pods are being injected as they come up, and the uh, dashboard is already picking this up. The dashboard is just a front end to uh, an API controller that we have on the back end. Um, most folks, when they're integrating Linkerd into their system, are using uh, our tap command. Um, let's see. Emoji photo. <coughs> that. That tells us uh, traffic that's coming in. This is you can think of this as like TCP for your request. So and all that is available through the UI as well. So that was the quick and dirty install of Linkerd. A couple of options that I didn't use here are there's an AJ mode which ensures that there are three copies of each of the control plane components so that if a node goes down you have redundant systems. Um, and then when we install with HA mode, it applies resource limits for your uh, CPU and memory to your pods. Um, but yeah, the, the design philosophy for Linkerd was to make it very quick and very easy to install. So, um, What's the Grafana link? Oh uh, yeah, call? Let's, let's take a look at that. <coughs> so we ship, we have a, a Grafana component and it ships with, like a, with some dashboards that we create. So we're looking at all the deployments in um, Emoji Moto namespace, and we're seeing that there are no metrics that are coming in. But let's see if we can find, make sure we're getting traffic there. <coughs> Looks like it's, yeah, it's definitely getting traffic. So we should expect to see some of these metrics come in. So you can see them for the linker D. Oh, did they show up? Yeah, there we go. So we're, these, the metrics that we emit are Prometheus metrics. Um, we get success rate, uh, all your latencies, request volume, these are 295. There should be 299 latencies. But this is on a per, 
per uh, deployment basis. So yeah, here we go. We have P99, P95, and P50 latencies. Small corner. Um, and there's a failure that's injected into this because it's a, an example application that we use for demos a lot. And so that's why we see that the success rates are, are not 100%. How is the latency calculated between between components, or I mean, how how real is the latency number? Yeah, so it's the when the proxy receives a request, <coughs> and if the request goes outbound, or if it's just handled by the service itself, and so it's the time when Linkerd receives a request, request and sends a response. Um, right. Thank you. And this just ships as a default. Yeah, staple set or something with. Uh, it is a deployment. Yeah, to deployment, and that is it's not staple. No. It's yeah, this is all done. <laughs> yeah. So this, it's this. Uh, we've got a on deployment here. And actually, this is all kind of like your your get going as fast as you can, but you can plug it into your own Prometheus and all that. Good yeah, stuff. yeah. So we for an HA or a production deployment, we have instructions or our documentation includes how to use uh, Prometheus Federation. Um, I want to go back to the question that you asked because it's actually, there's a nuance to it that's really important to understand. The latencies that could be measured from two distinct places, right? There's, you've got the communication between, that comes into the proxy, whatever that inbound is, and because the proxy is communicating with the service on the pod, there's a, some local host communication there. So there are two places that we could have collected these metrics. The first is where we do collect it from the inbound and when the response is sent out. But we could have also started collecting the metrics uh, at the point where Linkerd, the proxy sends the request to the service, right? And so there's like the tiniest little, little gap there, but um, the decision was made to collect it when the proxy receives it and sends the response. So the latency that you see is fully inside of the <coughs> <coughs> That's good. I, I'm glad you brought that up. It's a, Is there a separate metric for the total latency? Um, the total latency for, for like the full service. round trip through the whole service. Yeah. Um, a client to serve. Right. You're saying it's the proxy sitting at the server side that's measuring just the server side yeah. latency. So let's, let's pull up a... So the latency between service A and service B. Are you asking? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. How I would know that. That's what we're asking. Yeah. Well, because it knows when the, at least when the client issued the request. You can trace it, though. Yeah. So yeah, we do have an implementation for distributed tracing, and that's where you would collect that metric. Good. Okay. Um, but what we get is the total response time for the request that's handled. So that can be affected by when service one service talks to another service, right? Okay, good questions. So uh, I think that is all, that is what I'm obligated to show you with regard to installing Linkerd. Yeah, so the error rate you show, is that just based on HTTP status code? The which one? The error rate? Yeah, yes. okay. that's the status code that the service sends to the proxy. Is it the same with gRPC? A really good question. So we are implementing MTLS for TCP. Um, so you will get security out of it. Um, I don't think we can get metrics for TCP just yet. But that's as soon as we as soon as we accomplish multi-cluster, which is on the roadmap as well, then um, we are we're continuing. Actually, I shouldn't say it's more like a we're continuing to do work for TCP as well as multi cluster. But to answer your question, we're working on <coughs> securing TCP first. Thanks. So the Linkerd command line, um, when you're talking through that, is it just going to the, the Kubernetes API yep. and then into the stack? Yep. Yep. It's making all the pieces there. Um, actually, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> About the MTLS for uh, our gRPC, do you have such? Um, I mean, does it do that? Huh? Yeah, it goes off outside. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, yeah, right, because um, gRPC is secure by default. But uh, yeah, if you want to, you know, 
your certs uh, rotate them and all that type of stuff. Yeah, exactly. So that's some work that we just finished actually with cert, cert manager integration. Anybody's familiar with JetStack? Cert manager? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we've just integrated with that um, and we have support for rotating certificates. And, and I think I'm not supposed to tell you this, but that's because our uh, the reason that we we got we, we prioritized the work for rotating certificates is because um, when you install Linkerd, it had it generates that certificate for you. Um, it throws away the key, and then um, it's still free. Here. And so we found that there were quite a few customers and users, actually more users, who were going to be coming up on that. It's like I think the the doomsday date, as we call it, and this is all in in the GitHub issues repo, so it's not it's not any big secret. The doomsday date is like March twentieth or something like that. So we're we're well ahead of it. We have instructions for rotating stuff out. So yeah, um, even though gRPC is secure, the mutual part is what's really important. So knowing that when the two services are talking to each other, that they're using that same certificate that was issued by the identity service. Thank you. So does, does LinkedIn support uh, like a gateway component or somewhere at the ingress level where they can do it in the remote answer and yeah, there are a couple of questions in there. So it does do load balancing. The proxy itself does load balancing, latency-based load balancing. I'm gonna mess this up. It's um, S E W M A, which is uh, I always forget what that stands for. Something weighted measure average or something like that. Um, to your question about supporting ingress, Kubernetes has a great resource for ingress. It's called ingress, and so we. Uh, the again the, the team that makes decisions about features that go into Linkerd think that ingress is a concern that's outside of the service mesh. So we won't ever have an ingress, or sorry, we won't ever make our own gateway. We will, and this will tie. That's a really good question because it ties into some of the service mesh interface stuff that we're going to talk about. Later. Man, good questions. But I guess the key is is that. This really is, is east to west type traffic rather than north south, right? So that's where the distinction is, I think, between ingress and gateway. Yeah, but I mean, if, you know, Istio does ingress, right? Which is where the question yeah, comes from. And I think that's fine. I think it's fine that you don't. I'm actually think there's uh, Linkerd is it's like it's defined by the things it's not trying to do. Yeah, which is what it's trying to do. Yeah. Like it's focused. Well, Istio is way more than just the service. Yeah, that's, it, it, yeah, that's, that's true. true. I know folks that this is an entire platform. <laughs> yeah, folks that are trying to want to use it for API gateway style features, um, which is great. Um, I think that there is there again. This is not a we we think this is not a winner takes all situation. Istio started off with a ton of features, had a big community push behind it, big corporate push behind it, and they got a ton of features at the cost of performance. The Linkerd team started with performance, continues to maintain performance, and builds in features where we think they make sense. So it's just a different design philosophy. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, use a tool that's right for you. Any other questions? These are you're right, Paul. These are some sharp folks here. Okay. So who is familiar? Has anybody heard of Service Mesh Interface? Okay. I'm going to keep looking at you every time because you always <laughs> nod and it makes me feel good and I get confident. <laughs> the pain afterwards. The Service Mesh Interface was announced in May 2019 at the uh, KubeCon in Barcelona, KubeCon EU. It is a specification for service meshes that run on Kubernetes. Um, it was a project that involved. Um, <coughs> Microsoft, Deus Labs as part of Microsoft, Buoyant, the Linkerd community, Aspen Mesh, Apache Corp. We all work together recognizing that if there's going to be such a thing as a service mesh, there should be standards for implementing it. And so uh, the service mesh interface is just a specification that says if you're going to emit metrics, emit them in this way so that they can be consumed by. <coughs> Uh, components of service mesh interface. 
And so this provides a foundation of one of the key messages that I want to deliver tonight is that service mesh provides functionality that can then be built upon. That's really important to, to have, again, the metrics are the easiest example of that. And that's where, um, we, when we talk about the traffic splitting, the metrics that Linkerd admits are used to uh, determine whether uh, a, actually just to weight the traffic to one service or another. So the concepts of the service mesh interface currently, we, they started with the top three, and this is a, a, a GitHub repository as well. Um, I have a link for it in the slides. So um, the top three service mesh features are traffic policy, traffic, to, and that's implemented through OPA, and one of the interfaces, or one of the projects that's interfacing for policy is the Gatekeeper project. Um, Open policy agent is what OPA stands for. And traffic telemetry, this is, uh, I don't, I can't think of anybody who's using this. Actually, Flagger, the Flagger project, I think, is using this one. And then the traffic management piece is the piece that we implemented for uh, traffic split in the tree. And there will be more of those coming soon. This, those were just the top three. As they're identified, they'll add more specifications in. Just as of last week, the service mesh interface specification was, the proposal was made to donate to CNCF, which is really cool. Um, Wait, who owns it now? Where's, what's that? Where's it held now? Um, it's under the day, uh, DS Labs. Dang. Yeah, I think. Or it might be its own project. I think it's its own project. Service mesh interface. <coughs> the, the DS team kind of pushed everything through. They did a lot of the heavy lifting in getting the, the uh, governance set up for SMI. So anyway, uh, this is something that's fun to follow. It'll be very interesting. What you don't see on here is the technical oversight committee, the members who include uh, a gentleman by the name of Matt Klein fully supported this. So it's really cool that the community is getting behind it. So this is conceptually what the service mesh interface looks like. I took this from one of their slides. I wish that I could make slides as beautiful as these. They, it's the idea <coughs> is that the apps tooling and ecosystem will be consumers of uh, will be clients to services that emit <coughs> data in. The in the way that the service mesh interface specifies. So, um, yeah, it's just having a standard for things that the service mesh can provide. Flagger is a Weave project. Flagger is a Kubernetes operator that, I love this sense, it's a Kubernetes operator that automates the promotion of canary deployments using service mesh routing functionality based on Prometheus metrics. When I read that, I was like, what? I don't get this. Um, but let's take a look at their architecture. Their diagram helps a little bit. We see that within the, the architecture, Flagger is responsible for communicating with the Kubernetes API. It communicates with Prometheus, and it then configures what's called a canary resource. Uh, and this is a CRD that Flagger has created um, to then communicate to update the traffic split resource, which is a custom resource definition in the service mesh interface specification, so that we can see a smooth transfer of, of um, traffic as long as the requirements for what is determined to be a healthy service are met. So, I had to break this down for myself just to get a, a much simpler understanding for it. Again, my slides pretty much suck compared to the other ones, but this is how it works. <clears throat> so in the architecture, we've got this traffic split resource. Again, that's part of the SMI, the CRD, custom resource definition there. We configure a two services to traffic split weights, sends weighted traffic to each one of these uh, services. 
Flagger is responsible for communicating with the traffic split resource as well as Prometheus. It gets the metrics from Prometheus and it uses those metrics based on the logic that you provided, the canary resource, to update the traffic split to shift the weight across uh, <clears throat> each of the versions of the service. The proxies send their telemetry to Prometheus where Flagger picks it up. So this is gonna be latencies, success error rates. Um, I haven't fully explored all of the different conditions that you can use to ensure that uh, a service is healthy. But again, latencies are one of them. I think I'm pretty sure success rates are as well. And so we have <coughs> communicating together. Flagger is the requests are coming in. The proxies emit the metrics to Prometheus. Flagger reads those, does some logic to determine whether it's okay to scale up or scale down the amount of traffic that's going to each of the services or to actually just to redistribute the traffic that's going to each of the services. And the goal is to start with a, a version one and have 100% of the traffic going there and slowly send traffic over to version two um, based off of these metrics. So does that clarify? Does it make sense to everybody? Okay, good. I had to, it took me a minute to wrap my head around that. So, um, but y'all are smarter than me. So, a quick question on um, so like uh, draining of connections, um, WebSocket type stuff. Uh, how does it deal with all that in, 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 in a smart way? So, um, if, if I'm understanding the question properly, the draining the connections is going to happen. Like, are you talking about draining a node or even if you're just tapering off yeah, just tapering traffic off. into your service? Yeah. Um, that so if you're draining the node, the Kubernetes itself is going to... Yeah, I'm just talking about if we're moving from version one to version two, you have, you have live things on version one yeah. that you need to smooth, uh, smooth transition over. Yeah. And I was just wondering what, what smarts does it have to, to do that? Yeah, that's, that's the core of the Flagger operator is that uh, we'll take a look at a, a definition for a canary and we'll see... Um, Again, I, I hope you all don't mind reading some YAML, but uh, we'll see that the way that it's configured uh, specifies like a duration. And um, so how often Flagger checks the health of the service and it'll say, if it's healthy on this interval, <coughs> this much. How much flexibility is there in Flagger? Like, can you have only one canary in flight? Or <coughs> You can go crazy <laughs> yeah, as many as you'd like. Yeah, um, it's on a per service basis. So when we talk about traffic split, we're talking about usually two services. You can have many services. I don't recommend it because you're going to drive probably your if if you are the cluster operator, or if, or if you're the person who's in charge of CI/CD, um, you might drive them crazy if you're trying to do like nine versions of something with traffic split and. Um, using Canary to to roll those out. I think by definition, Canary is typically um, version one to version two or version three to version four. In theory, you could have multiple um, for a service, or you could have multiple Canaries for multiple services. I would argue the that, that's true with the exception of like header-based routing for testing in production, where you can. Well, oh, that's true. Well, he was just, I was expecting a cheer, expecting to get up and cheer. So, you know, the, the, the canary, the concept of canary is with you know, you deploy a copy of your service and nothing goes to it except for things that explicitly asked. That might be a case where you might have n number of things. Yeah. Well, is there, is there a set of rules in Flagger that lets you determine what traffic gets, gets moved over first? There are definitely conditions. I don't, I don't know how. How how granular. Granular. How granular. Um, at the moment, Linkerd doesn't inspect headers. Linkerd does uh, that. What's that? I was going to say, Link, that's, Linkerd would be a better fit for inspecting traffic. Yeah, and that's Linkerd. Linkerd headers? Do we do layer seven? It, it's not inspecting headers at the moment. Uh, that's certainly get that request. Go upload it on GitHub issues. Because <laughs> we get that request a lot. And I think that actually, it's, I, I'm certain that 
it's going to come out of the multi-cluster work that is support for headers and then possibly even request bodies. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, oh yeah, go ahead. You, you said per service. We have a lot of uh, phone numbers listening to queues. Can you use, uh, can you create Canary on, on a non-service based deployment? So are you, you're talking queues like a pub sub or a, a message queue? A message queue, yeah. Message queue. Um, so yeah, describe, describe to me how the traffic goes through. So the message queue gets the traffic or gets the, the message and then it sends it out to whatever subscribers there are. Right. Um, and then you're versioning the subscribers. Is that multiple new subscribers will allow to do so a, a new version. Um, do the same thing that you were talking about with Prometheus metrics. Okay. Are the subscribers service based? No, they're not. They're not. Okay. So they're not uh, they're not service on the deployment is connected to the um, to the messaging system. Okay. Mr. Clark, the deployment is connected to the messaging system. So it's asynchronous. Each of the clients is filling out stuff on the queues. Right. Yeah, so we're we're model. Yeah, I think that sounds like that's entirely up to your queuing <clears throat> system to figure out how to do, right? Like, because this all these are built around network traffic, like, and you know, API calls. But I, I think maybe <coughs> answer this with the custom metrics. <laughs> right. You'd use that to hook into Prometheus, which then would would pass it on to Flagger. So it's kind of a weird thing, but you could do it through custom metrics. Yeah, admittedly, I don't have a ton of experience. The processing is very, very different. Than yeah, yeah. I don't have API. a ton of experience with those, and I, I wonder even if the concepts of of canaries in a queue environment, how those overlap. I'd be happy to sit down afterwards and whiteboard something and see if we can figure out a good answer. Yep. You said you mentioned something about multi cluster. Yeah. What does that look like? <laughs> <laughs> That's the question. It's taken us six months to make a decision on it because every time we ask somebody what they think multi cluster is, it's a completely different answer. And then, well, it's not a completely different answer, but we get a lot of different answers when we ask somebody, when we ask one user mm -hmm. what they want out of multi cluster. And it might be a single control plane and telemetry from the same workload <laughs> running in different answers uh, in different areas. Um, another use case, uh, well, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but that was one that we got a lot. So what we did is we pulled a lot of folks and said, what's the overlap here? What is the low hanging fruit that we can very, um, that we can implement in a good way? In, in, the more, in the more near time frame, so that we can develop this multi cluster support. So, um, and the, what I just asked you is what it's going to be. So, single control plane collecting metrics from across multiple clusters. That's where we're starting, and then we'll go from there. I asked one to one, you deploy uh, MongoDB and the dashboards on each cluster that you have. Yep, on a single cluster, yeah, that's right. Yep. Okay. Anybody want to learn about canary deployments? Oops. So I set this demo up beforehand because there are a few moving pieces and again, my typing isn't the best. So what I've done uh, let's see, is there's a, a great tutorial on oh. Actually, two tutorials. One is on the on our, our docs, and one's on the Flagger docs about how to get started with a canary deployment. What I want to go over with you now is the pieces that I've deployed. Um, we'll take a, a close look at the canary resource that we talked about, as well as the traffic split resource. Um, and I think that'll help to take that diagram that I had earlier and put it into like meaningful things that are running. At running pods and processing resources. So um, let's look at all the pods in the namespace or in the, in the cluster. This is, I switched clusters. This is um, an AKS cluster where I deployed all of it. So this canary deployment namespace <coughs> is my, 
where the workloads that I'm going to ship the traffic are running. And we have Linkerd here. This is the control plane. This is the same thing that you saw earlier. So uh, with the exception of there's an additional flagger component here. So um, again, this is the most base installation that you can get to, to see how traffic split works or canary deployments work. Um, I've got a cheat sheet here that I need to bring up. So let's take a look first at the canary resource. Is this readable? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the interesting bits are the spec, right? And so, in fact, when I created this resource, it was really just the spec that was here. We can see it here. Also. Um, we have a target ref, which is the name of the deployment that we know that we're going to scale. And in this case, it's called pod info. Uh, it's got a service, and that tie, that maps directly to the Kubernetes service resource that is being used, and it, it uses the port to identify that. And the canary analysis part is the the logic piece that again I need to dive more into it to understand uh, the metrics that we can use to for the traffic split or for the for draining the traffic from one service one version to the other. So what this is saying is every <coughs> five seconds, and actually currently you'll see that in this environment it's 10 seconds, I changed this after the fact. Every five seconds, um, if things are healthy, then increase the weight by 10. And that's, you can think of it as 10% or just 10, <coughs> 10 out of 100 of the weight that's going on, that's weighted traffic. And the metric that we're using is the request success rate. So 99% uh, of the requests within a minute have to be successful. And if that's the case, then we shift another 10, shift another 10, shift another 10. Does that make sense? And then, what's the what say the threshold was? Uh, 99%. No, the threshold on the canary analysis. Uh, <coughs> Oh, oh, this threshold. Um, I don't have to look that up. Um, it's either the number of successes or failures. It's probably the number of a number of five second intervals that have to succeed in a row. Is my guess. I think that's right. I will look it up and let you know. Um, and we have a traffic split resource. And this was generated directly for us by Flagger when we, when I installed Flagger earlier. So again, the, the interesting piece of it here is this, this spec. So we're specifying backends, which map directly to service resources in Kubernetes. And right now it says the service pod info canary gets zero and uh, primary gets 100. <coughs> I could manually change this to, when I do it just a normal traffic split demo, we manually update, update these files to see that the uh, resources, to see that the traffic goes 20, 80, 50, 50. <coughs> but what I want to do is go through and we'll watch the traffic actually being shifted over. So let's, I need to port forward 90. Go back to my cheat sheet here. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. And I put all these demos on, um, they'll, it'll go into my GitHub account. So I kind of do these as like quick and dirty, how can I get things up and running and just start playing with it. So this will be up there tomorrow or sometime. So uh, actually, before let's look at our services. So our services that we have right now our pod info, or sorry, front end pod info, pod info canary, pod info primary. Um, and oops, to do is if we go to the host 98, we see that I have this pod info 
Um, and this is part of the demo that the uh, Stefan Coden from WeWorks wrote. So, um, you know, we've got version 1.7.1 here. That makes sense. So we've got a service, the primary version of the service, and we're now going to change the image that that service uses. The canary resource that we just saw is going to detect that and manage the traffic resource to begin to split the traffic over to reroute the traffic. So, Right now, there shouldn't be anything going, or there shouldn't be any traffic going. It'll take a minute for it to kick, or about 10 seconds for it to kick in. Um, let's look at the canary. So, yeah, it's already sending 10% of the traffic over there. And so, if I sit here and hit this enough times, maybe one out of 10 will get the green screen. I think you're gonna hit that ping button. Oh, is that what it is? Or not? <laughs> well, we see that the it is progressing. Um, one of the things that we can look at is a <coughs> uh, linker D, or sorry, the traffic split resource. Your browser cache may be defeating you. Oftentimes, that is the case. <coughs> so let's look at the linker D. Sorry, this is the SMI. Look at the implementation of the SMI resource. So uh, we see that it's progressing 50, 60, and we see that that's matching over here. So again, that that <coughs> operator, flagger canary operator, is collecting these metrics. And probably if I tailed the logs of that flagger um, pod, we would see that polling happen. Does that make sense? Does that like does that give you a good idea of what's happening? So under the hood, it's contacting the the proxy and changing the settings. Once. So yeah, under the hood, yep, under the hood, it's pulling metrics from Prometheus, analyzing those metrics and then shifting the weight, or updating this traffic resource, the one that we see here, to slowly increment the size down. Is it only changing the routing, or would it also handle scaling up pods, or that has to be done by the HPA? We use HPA for that. Um, so you have to make sure your increment's small enough that you don't overwhelm. Like a 50% jump might mean you land on a place that's not scaled. Yeah, that's possible. Um, I, I think I remember seeing in the flagger docs something about auto scale. So there may be a, a big asterisk next to that, but in this case, um, HPA takes care of all that separately. It, it, maybe it was flagger, but I know one of them, like as it has to do its roll back, you're not going for maybe you were at 90% and then something went wrong and has to go back and you don't want to be on a cold yeah. deployment there either. So like they might pre scale yeah. up on that. Yeah. And if I'm getting, you previous diagram, you had kind of like service mesh in the middle. You had Linkerd at the bottom, and you had the community stuff at the top. In this example, Linkerd is at the bottom, the traffic split resource is the middle, and Flagger is the top. Right? Like you're kind of, the traffic split is the one thing that both components agree on intrinsically that lets them communicate without communicating. So I cheated a bit in this diagram. Oh, so you already got that. Yeah. I cheated a bit in that diagram just to simplify it. Um, when we look at we look at the traffic split resource. The concept of the traffic split resource is that there is an apex service, and that apex service um, is responsible for defining which services are getting get this the traffic splits. Right. This tends to trip a lot of people up because right now pod info primary is my apex service, and it is also a leaf service. So we have Apex services and leaf services. Um, it's, it becomes much more clear when we define this as an Apex service that is more, it's basically a headless service that has leaf services that are distinct in name. Um, so 
so yeah, does that, does that answer your question? And then behind the scenes, Swagger is also changing the names of changing what pod info canary and pod info primary point to. So I was going to ask that. So if the flip was a rename, yeah. Okay. So there's a little that's 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 something that can be a gotcha if you're not prepared for it. So when you say service, it's it's basically all the service to service traffic. When you say traffic, it's basically service to service communication. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so this this might help a little bit here. We have uh, the back ends. We've got the service pod info canary, pod info primary, and we see that those are actual. Uh, so that's my shortcut for to control get service. Um, we see that those are the actual services, service resources that are deployed to Kubernetes. Can you go back and look at the YAML and how how the Prometheus metrics that you're concerned about are defined? Uh, yeah, let's, <coughs> that might be something that we have to look at together. You're talking about the canary, right? Right. So, actually, you know what? I have this. Let's go here because this is the same exact thing and it's a little bit easier to read. So, I think the part that you're asking about is this, right? This metrics piece. Okay. And so is there a way, I assume, that you can say you want it to be small instead of large? Or, you know, yeah. if, it's, if, or if it's not percent-based, that, you know, what the range that you care about or something like that? Let's look at that together because I need to learn this myself. Um, let's see. Docs. So we know that Flagger can use metrics. I don't know the extent to which it can use them. So let's see. There's the auto scaler reference. <laughs> I remember seeing something that talked about it. So that would be advanced, advanced demo next time I'm out. <laughs> HTTP and custom metrics on the right in the menu. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So it looks like I, I imagine these are predefined this request success rate. Um, there's some Istio queries. I don't, I don't know how to read that. <laughs> uh, duration there. So we've got, yeah, duration looks like an option. I wish that there were a just a list of what each one is, right? Well, you, you just put what yeah. is custom, so. Uh, Anything you can tie down to a number, <laughs> like in a Prometheus query. <coughs> yeah, it looks like it's flexible enough to do what it would. Yeah, yeah, right. It looks like a, a Prometheus query. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, metric may be a bad name for that because it's not really. Is web hooks what you call back in the container somehow for the help? Right. Or, or just the web hooks. I look it up online. No, I, I mean, this is fun for me to learn along with you because I, don't, I wish I knew everything, but I don't. Um, yeah, I've not read this documentation. I'm not quite sure how these work. But, I basically call the URL and it gets a a response and parses it in some preform format. <coughs> Basic logic based on that. So I think the takeaway here is that the query is pretty powerful. You, you can probably get anything that you want and make all, all kinds of complex queries for your auto scale or for your uh, canary deployments. Does it look like? So just out of curiosity, if you were to do a canary, is anybody doing canary deployments right now? Okay, um, and so what what metrics are you using? Like, if you want it, to it's all it. human based, so we just have a separate deployment as <coughs> part of we'll the set. Uh, so you can roll to one pod if you want more, you scale that up manually, and it's more to make sure that the code you deploy doesn't just explode. And if it does, then it explodes on one instead of your entire fleet. Gotcha. Does that work for you just because you've got every service has got a lot of replicas? Because the, the classic problem with that is if you only got three and you like you're getting you're not getting like ten percent of traffic. You suddenly can get. I mean, 30%. So we would never go less than two. 
And so the worst case scenario is you deploy two normal front pods and one canary take a third of the traffic as your canary. And if you want more, you just say, well, here's me six instead of three. Great. Uh, so that is all I have but for one more slide, which talks about our Unity community. Um, it's a fun group. Lots of really smart people, I think. Our, our Slack channel, we get a lot of fun questions, people asking interesting things. Um, so if you decide that you're going to get involved with, or if you want to even just try out Linkity, come join us there. I'm always on there answering questions because it's what I like to do. Um, so yeah, we looks like we're ahead of time. So I'm happy to hang out and answer questions. So yeah. Uh, I'm curious from how, from your perspective, for me, like when I look at Istio and Linkerd, it feels like Java versus Go to me. Like Istio is like, yeah, we'll do all the things. And Linkerd seems to be very, explicit and deliberate about when to add features. I don't, I don't know what kind of the philosophy is behind that or... Exactly, it's just that that design philosophy in particular is... So there's, and that came from what we learned with Linkerd1. Anybody ever heard of Linkerd1? Speaking of the JVM? Yeah. So yeah, we, and there are still customers who are using Linkerd1. In fact, I, I get to go watch the Super Bowl from a war room from a particular television station that you uh, using Linkerd uh, one. And so I'll be there with my finger on the button monitoring it. But the point that I, the reason I bring that up is because when we, when we wrote Linkerd 2, um, we took the things that we learned in Linkerd 1, things we knew that we wanted to be important. Um, again, observ observability, uh, security, reliability, and uh, traffic management. And with Linkerd1, there was actually a plugin system as well. And that's something that we're thinking about for Linkerd2, but we're going to do it in a way that doesn't allow people to shoot themselves in the foot by dropping in some massive Scala module, Scala module that um, shoots them in the foot, <laughs> you know? So uh, yeah, it's just a design philosophy difference. Um, I think Istio is pluggable as well, our current version of it. <clears throat> and we're seeing that their design philosophy is changing too. So yeah, I, I, at the end of the day, the thing that makes open source so great <coughs> is when people, first of all, diversity in options, right? You can, not only is there diversity in service meshes, you have Connect, Istio, you have diversity in Istio, you can have Aspen Mesh, there's Kuma, right? Is that no, Mesh, that's the, I look at you because you feel like you would know. Mesh is the um, column implementation with that relies on Istio. Well, it started with Istio and now they're just using Envoy with the So, a diversity and service question. I think it's great. Each one of them is going to have a um, Follow up, you mentioned, all right, there will never be a north south controller. Are there any other? I don't know, kind of common like Istio features where basically it's a hard no or it's a long time before we even think about that. Yeah, and I think there's a middle ground. One of the that comes off the top of my head is uh, OAuth. We get people saying, can you have your proxy do OAuth? We certainly can. Um, it's um, the middle ground that I'm talking about, I think is filled by that SMI. I'd love to see SMI have a spec that says this is what uh, a service mesh should do when it gets an OAuth token to kick it off to an OAuth provider to ver to validate the token or JOTS, JOT OAuth. That's one off the top of my head. Um, I think of another one because we get those a lot. Okay. Uh, API gateway type of stuff, rate limiting. Rate limiting is one that Linkerd will never do. Really? As of today, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Never today. Tomorrow, yeah. yeah. As of today, What's yes. What's the motivation behind that? <laughs> yeah. Really? yeah, about, about the hard no on it. That's uh, the, the message is that that's an API gateway concern. Mm -hmm. So we, that's traffic that's coming in. People are getting this to east-west um, that it should be rate limited. 
What about like your internal, like you have a rogue service that all of a sudden is spam bot? Yeah. Um, then we spam ourselves. I mean, other companies I know about spam themselves. <laughs> scaling up one service more than. I mean, other yeah. asking for friends. Yeah. Asking for friends. <laughs> I tell my wife that all the time. She's like, no, you're not. Um, so, yeah, uh, there are. So, rate limiting is one solution to that problem. Another is. Um, so if you do end up spamming a service, you can actually expect that its performance will degrade. And in that case, when you're doing latency-based load balancing, which Linkity does, we would actually expect that that problem wouldn't, wouldn't solve itself, but it would be, uh, it would have less of an impact as just like the service falls away altogether. You might see that service scaling up and you got an auto scaler running and it might just, you might see a blow up uh, horizontally, but yeah, um, yeah. For right now, I don't see us doing rate limiting. Okay. Do you have any additional tool chain or constructs for multi-tenancy at all? Uh, multi-tenancy is is something we're working on. We've been <coughs> to do some of the work around that tap feature that I showed you. Um, did I show you tap? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, the tap feature that I showed you is, so as you saw from the dashboard, anybody who has access to the dashboard can see all of the namespaces. That's something we're aware of and we're, we are addressing multi-tenancy. And the way that we're doing that is, um, the, so we, I wear two hats at, at Boeing. Uh, my job where they pay me and the Linkerd stuff that I like to do. Boeing actually <laughs> has, <laughs> Boy, it actually has a product that we're using internally to measure. Uh, actually, it's yeah, people using it as well. It's for setting and measuring SLOs and SLAs. Um, and so we use Linkerd to build that product. Uh, so the reason that I bring that up is because um, it's, it helps us to understand um, in that case because so Dive is the product, it's software as a service, and it is, keeps track of teams work, but it's multi -tenant, It's a multi-tenant cluster, right? So we have, in our production cluster, we have multiple users um, in each namespace, and they, we, we need them to have separation. So we're using that as our guideline for building out multi-tenancy. To answer your question about tool chain, tooling for multi-tenancy, we don't have anything that I'm aware of. That team, I can go and ask them for you. So I'll get your email address and I'll go and ask them and see what they get their thoughts on multi-tenancy, especially tool chain around that. Yeah, good questions. Anything else? On, uh, so you're not doing north-south, uh, but where do you <coughs> recommend injecting the proxy into say, uh, in uh, Nginx is uh, the thing. Is. If you want metrics from your ingress, uh, you definitely we, we can inject uh, Linkerd into <coughs> traffic um, or uh, ambassador Nginx. One of the really important use cases for that is distributed tracing. So our distributed tracing support uses open census and so we need something to initiate the trace span ID, mm -hmm. and we use Nginx for that. Anybody using distributed tracing? Yeah, it's so oh, you are. I mean, it's it's great for like we get so many people who are like, do you do distributed tracing? Do you do distributed tracing? We finally did distributed tracing, and it's like, mm, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we do find it useful for is that one deployment that goes out and slows everything down. You can take your snapshots of what was what what was your waterfall? What did your spans look like before? What do they look like after? And to be able to debug that way. So when we talk about distributed tracing, we talk about how it is more of a a tool in your kit for debugging and troubleshooting your services, but it's certainly not a single reference or a single mechanism for debugging your entire application application. Yes. 
Um, I'm an open census fan. Okay. Do you know when you plan to switch to open telemetry? Um, I don't. Yeah. It's uh, a good question. Probably as those projects begin to merge together. So my colleague who did that work, uh, as, as I'm remembering his grumbling about the <laughs> open census, um, I, I think we'll as those projects begin to become uh, better intertwined or you know, more cohesive, then we'll probably look into switching to open telemetry. Yeah. Well, let's uh, end this, and then if you wanna have Q and A afterwards. That's great. Uh, other. Thanks so much, Charles. And again, the contact information is here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> contact us. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming.